Hi, morning everyone and welcome to another episode of our CSEC lecture series. This is a collaborative event with the Institute of Jamaica and the University of the West Indies um, History and Archaeology Department. And we just want to thank you so much for tuning in again on our social media platforms. My name is Alexis McDavid and I am an outreach officer at National Museum Jamaica, which is a division of the Institute of Jamaica. And uh, with me here today, I have Dr. Enrique Okenve. Um, Dr. Okenve teaches African and oral history at the UWI campus. And since 2007, he is, has been the current head of department, of the history department. His cross-disciplinary research combines the use of traditional historical sources and oral history as reflected in published articles and book chapters dealing with different aspects of Equatorial Guinea's social and political history. So thank you so much, Dr. Kenve, for tuning in and well, coming down with us um, here at University Campus and to do this lecture series. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis, for having me. Mm -hmm. So let's get started. Um, the theme is Caribbean economy and slavery, and the topic is transatlantic trade in Africans organization, impact on West African societies, and experiences of its victims. Mm -hmm. And the first question to kickstart it um, is, what were African societies like before the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans? OK. Um, yes, thanks for that question, because I, I think it, that's a relevant question when it comes to um, understanding these aspects of Africa's history, but also this aspect of, um, of uh, Caribbean history. Most uh, students in the Caribbean tend to think of Africa and Africa's history almost as the beginning with the, the, the transatlantic trade in South Africans. But the issue is, or the key question here, is to know that Africa's history it goes back way, way, uh, uh, like, uh, like thousands of years before the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans uh, began. So it's important for us to think about, about what Africa was like for thousands of years before this uh, uh, tragic trade uh, uh, started. And, and also it's important for us to think what, what Africa was like uh, uh, right before the beginning of the transatlantic trade. If we think about, for example, thousands of, for thousands of years, uh, those kind of developments, obviously we don't have time to deal with it now. You will have to come to the Department of History and Archaeology and do one of our courses in African history, for example. But for now, let's focus a little bit on what is the context right before the transatlantic trade. One of the things that I want you to think about it is that, first of all, when it comes to the transatlantic trade, we have to think of two particular regions in Africa. Africa, a huge continent, about three times the size of the United States, to put things in perspective. I don't know how many thousand times the size of Jamaica, right? So it's a huge continent with a few regions involved in the trade, but fundamentally two large regions, West, and, uh, West Africa and West Central Africa. The West Central Africa, we should not forget about it because, in, in fact, many of the enslaved Africans who came into the Americas came from West Central Africa, the area in and around Congo, Angola, and so on. Oftentimes, we just think of West Africa, but farther to the south, uh, the vast majority of Africans came from that, that region. But having said that, we have to think uh, about Africa's relations and international relations before the transatlantic trade. And one of the things that oftentimes we forget is that before the transatlantic trade, uh, Africans were involved in all the type of uh, international trades. In the Indian Ocean, for example, uh, the Swahili people and uh, Eastern and Southern African peoples were involved with Arab uh, in, in trade through uh, maritime exchanges and so on. In West Africa in particular, it is the trans-Saharan trade that link West Africa to North Africa and the Mediterranean and the Middle Eastern hubs and so on. So there were intense commercial relations uh, from at least the 8th eighth, uh, eighth century. Uh, it's particularly in the inland regions that are not going to play a major role in the transatlantic trade. It's particularly in the, in the inland regions of, of West Africa where we find significant involvement in the trade. But that trade, the trans-Saharan trade, also expanded uh, to the coastal and semi-coastal areas. Uh, but as I said, in the inland regions is where we see the, the greatest involvement and the greatest, um, uh, the most significant development. One of them, of course, 
is the, 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 the rise of large kingdoms, even empires, like the empire of uh, Ghana, Mali, and so on. Those empires basically develop as a result of the trading activities, controlling the trade within the area, benefiting from the middle. Uh, they, they were intermediaries, basically, between uh, uh, the peoples from farther south and the Arabs from the north. And out of that trade, th those commercial activities, that's how they basically were able to benefit expand their political power out, out of that, the wealth that they obtain. On the coastal and semi-coastal uh, parts of West Africa, we see that uh, they also participated in this trade, as I mentioned. They were, for example, supplying collar knots that were greatly appreciated in the savanna regions, uh, cotton textiles, and especially gold. The gold was fundamental in terms of the trans-Saharan trade because West Africa became the main source of, of gold for the commercial activities of the Mediterranean and the Middle East and so on. West Africa was the main supply of gold for, uh, uh, during this era. We're talking about basically from the 8th century, from the 700s, all the way to the 1400s before the arrival of the Europeans, uh, even though the, the trans-Saharan trade continued for many more centuries after that. Uh, Farther to the south, in the region that I referred earlier on as West Central Africa, obviously they're not involved in the trans-Saharan trade. However, there's still there are also regional developments there that are important from the economic and also from a political perspective, because in, the, in that region we're going to see the, the development of early markets and commercial exchanges, and also the rise of a powerful kingdom like the Congo, the Kingdom of Congo. Um, those, significant, those developments are important because, in a way, they are going to facilitate later on the commercial exchanges with the, with the Europeans. Uh, here, for example, we can see some of what I was referring to. If you see, uh, if you see this map, you see these are the kind of like trade routes that crisscross much of like uh, uh, the region that we know as West, Central, and even the Eastern Sudan, which is basically the area of Africa south of the Sahara Desert. From there, that's where we see that the middlemen, uh, uh, middlemen empires or intermediary commercial empires develop, but they are linking regions farther to the south, all the way to North Africa and to the to the Middle East. So these empires develop as a result of the these commercial exchanges, and they de develop at different points. The first one of these large empires was the empire known as Ghana or Wagadu Empire, which are basically from the late 700s develop. Right, and control all of this area, and in, and, and in expanding across all of this area is controlling the trade routes in, in, in this part of West Africa. The, it, this this uh, large empire was succeeded by the Mali Empire, which became even larger, one of the wealthiest empires in history at the time. Right? And when this empire declined, we also see the, the, the rise of a new large empire, also a commercial empire, the Songhai uh, uh, Empire. All of this is happening in the interior of West Africa, but as I said, farther to the south uh, or farther to the, uh, to the west on the coastal regions, we also see significant developments at the time. Mm -hmm. Why did Europeans begin trading with Africans from the 1400s? Okay, so this is, this is another thing that it's important for us to think about it. What like, uh, um, oftentimes we think that the development of the transatlantic trade uh, began with the, with the arrival of, of the Europeans in the Americas and so on, but we know that actually it started, started for, uh, from before. And to understand why, why it started before, the, before 1492, before the, uh, the late 1400s, uh, and, and we need to understand what was happening in, in Europe at the time, particularly in southwestern Europe. Right? One of the things that oftentimes we forget is how marginal Western European position was at the time at the international level. Right? Um, there was international trade for thousands of years had been, especially for, for the past uh, 3,000 years, there had been imp important international trade linking the area that we know as Afro-Eurasia, so from the Middle East to the Far East uh, to North Africa, the southern parts of Europe, all of that area. Uh, there, there were commercial routes, and ov obviously East Africa as well. Uh, there are commercial routes linking uh, much of the world. But in, 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 the, in the 1400s, Europe did not really play a major role in, this, in, in the control of this trade. Uh, the Middle East was the main commercial hub, and, and from there it received goods from all across the world, and they were exchanged in this, in this part of the world. Fundamentally, it's the Ottoman Empire, which at the time was the hegemonic power, uh, in the world, uh, or in this part of the world, that control this Middle Eastern, this rich Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern trade, and that had significant implications 
as it relates to uh, Western Europe. Because basically, the Ottoman Empire developed a series of policies that prevented Europeans from gaining direct access to those commercial routes and, and so on. So basically, it monopolized the trade in the Middle East. And at some point, they even expanded, they expanded their operations to the West, controlling uh, regions of, um, of southeastern Europe, but also of um, North Africa. In that sense, it's basically, it, it, it created even like greater um, uh, marginalization for Europe, for southwestern Europe in particular, which did not really have much room to operate within these uh, significant uh, commercial operations. Um, in addition to that, there's another factor that we should not forget. It's religion. Uh, the Ottoman Empire is a Muslim empire. And that also created some kind of ideological or spiritual reasons why uh, Southwestern European nations did not want to accept, or, or, or kingdoms did not want to accept this, this reality. And this is why, for example, we see that the, the, the two emerging kingdoms, powerful kingdoms like Portugal and Castile, Spain, if you like, Castile is, uh, is the, it was the, the, main, the main kingdom in, in what is known today as uh, Spain. They, they try to bypass um, the Ottomans, try to gain direct access to the rich uh, Asian trade. Um, and and they, this is now the peri period in, in, in the 1400s when they're going to try to find alternative routes and so on. And, and one of the things that we know that helped them is the recovery of some of the knowledge uh, from previous, uh, pr previous eras, from the classic era, era, age, uh, the Greeks uh, had accumulated a lot of uh, geographical knowledge. That knowledge obviously was acquired from other peoples, from the Egyptians, from the Persians, and so on. But that Greek uh, knowledge uh, um, was, was kept within you know, Europe, and it's now that they're going to rely on this type of knowledge to, uh, to find uh, alternative routes. This is a map of the, of the Ottoman Empire, and this is basically is showing, you, showing you the areas there are the large areas that they control in the Middle East, uh, Southeastern Europe, and of course, much of North Africa. And from there, you can see if the Middle East is the main commercial hub at the time, they, they are preventing European people, especially Western European people, from uh, uh, benefiting from, from the commercial exchanges in this part of the world. Why did mm -hmm. Africans participate in the transatlantic trade? OK. Uh, before before that, um, sorry. Before that, let oh. me yeah. Let me let me just tell you a, a little bit about the arrival of the of the Portuguese, right? So if you before we know we go to to why Africans participated in the trade, it's important to know what happens when the Portuguese arrive. The Portuguese are the first Europeans who arrive in the in the area, right? And in the beginning, they are trading with Africans, and but they're trading not in enslaved people fundamentally. They're trading in different commodities that, they, that, that are, are, are found in, in, in West Africa on the Atlantic coast and, and in and the semi-coastal coast, uh, coast of, of Atlantic Africa. This is happening from the, 14, from the 1440s, right? Um, as I said, I, I, as, as I said in, at this point, there's no significant trade in enslaved people, and the, and the commercial exchanges are, are relatively minor. But, but basically now they are going to be able to trade directly with West African peoples and gain access to some of the gold that was coming from, from this area. Right? They're all the good things which like they are interested, the Portuguese are interested, but the Portuguese are also playing an important role. They also are playing the role of uh, basically they're shipping goods from one part of Africa to another part of Africa. And in that way, they are playing that role of like a, 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 like almost like a shipping uh, a company that is linking different uh, air regions of West Africa and Atlantic Africa, and in that sense, stimulating commercial exchanges in, in the sense. Um, at the same time, Africans became slowly but surely increasingly increasingly interested in some of the products that the Europeans, the Portuguese in this case, had, had to bring. So this is the context, immediate context. The 1400s, there's only a small scale trade in enslaved Africans, which is basically to feed uh, some of the uh, islands of the um, of the coast of Africa, where the Portuguese first developed plantation in, uh, economies, like in Cape Verde, the Azores, and, and so on, right? But at this point, there's no much uh, 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 trade uh, or significant trade with the Europeans, or especially not in, in enslaved Africans. In this map uh, here, I show you why the Portuguese are arriving in West Africa. Fundamentally, they are trying to, to, to circumnavigate the African continent, go to Asia directly, and so on. So now to your question of why, why Africans participated in, in, in this trade. Um, the first thing that we have to think is of the favorable conditions. 
Africans, especially in West Africa, had been participating in, this tra in, in international trade, if you think about it, uh, for many centuries. The trans-Saharan trade had created already like some sort of like a, a, um, appetite, so to speak, for Africans to, to, to link to international and regional trade networks. In addition to that, obviously, they had developed their own local networks, commercial networks, and, and so on, right? So um, all of this, all the expansion of the local and regional West African markets created favorable conditions for a new type of international trade. Uh, in this case, will be the tran uh, transatlantic, uh, the transatlantic trade. There's a predisposition for the transatlantic trade. Uh, the European commercial demand increased over time, and and that European commercial demand increased also the the ability of local rulers, local West African rulers, to benefit from a new type of commercial, a new type of commercial exchanges. So not only they're benefiting from trading with the, um, with the peoples in the savannah areas uh, to, to supply the, the trans-Saharan trade, but now also they are also benefiting directly from trading with the Europeans without the middlemen uh, in, in the inland region. So of course they are attracted to, to that notion. Um, this wealth was especially appreciated by, by the local elites because the, the, the local elites, the ruling elites along w the West African coast are benefiting from it. They're using the, the new type of wealth uh, from this trade to uh, expand their political power. But during, during this first uh, couple of centuries from the mid 1400s to the late 16 or to the mid 1600s, we have to think that there is going to be obviously an increase in the demand for enslaved people, especially since the arrival of the Europeans in the Americas. But that demand grew very slowly for the first uh, century and a half and so on. So during the, during the 15, uh, 1500s and, 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 and the, the growth uh, in, the, in, the, in the trading and slave Africans, it's, it's relatively, relatively um, uh, slow. Um, so one of the things that we see is that uh, this trade will develop uh, or will increase significantly from the mid-1600s. From the mid-1600s, we're going to see the development of um, uh, plantation economies across parts of the Caribbean, also South America, and so on. And that is what is going to increase uh, the, Euro the European demand. But it's important. One of the things that I always tell the students is important for us, if we are going to understand why Africans are participating in the trade, it's important that we understand that we're looking at participation in the trade for almost four centuries. That particip participation in the trade for four centuries, we have to look at it that the reasons why they participated in the 1400s or in the 1500s are not necessarily the same as the reasons why they participated in the trade in the 1700s or in the early 1800s. There are different reasons. Um, by the late 1600s, this slave trade is already very profitable for the local elites in West Africa. But before that, it wasn't. Right? So, so why they participating before, and, and, and uh, that, I mean, it, it, it clearly it's just like, well, it's just another type of exchanges, it's another type of trade, right? But not the most profitable one. But from the mid-1600s, what we're going to see is that the increase in demand and the increase in the value of enslaved people is going to uh, uh, lead to significant impact in terms of the expansion uh, of, of their wealth and so on. So let's think about the expansion of this trade in a gradual way, right? And, and, and also, even when it comes to the decline of the trade, we also have to think about the decline also happening very gradually. Students tend to think that, okay, from 1807, the British abolished the slave trade, and that's the end of the trade. That's not the case. Actually, the trade continued to be very, very, uh, 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 very active until the late 1840s or even into 1850, right? Uh, a significant number of African people were traded during the first half of the 1800s. So these are different developments, and when the students look at this question, they have to think at what particular type, uh, time, time in, in, in during, during, during this era they are examining. Um, not all West African and Central African regions participated equally. That's another thing that we have to think about it, is that there are parts of West and parts of West Central Africa which are participated in the trade uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in significant, uh, uh, and, and we see that there's a significant supply of uh, enslaved people, but there are other regions that do, do not do that. Um, and what is it that they're obtaining? Well, so Africans, basically, those who are participating in the trade are obtaining clothes, uh, curry shells, and manila rings, important because, as I said, there is local trade 
and those cowrie shells and manila rings are used as um, they're used as uh, currency. And in that, in those commercial exchanges, local commercial exchanges, they use this as form of payment and so on. So the Europeans are also bringing these uh, cowrie shells and manila, which is almost like bringing like if you think about it, it's like bringing in cash, right? And they they value that. And of course, guns and gunpowder. That's highly appreciated because also in terms of the competition, internal competition between different kingdoms in the region, they, they, uh, there's military confrontation and access to guns and gunpowder from the 1700s will be uh, very relevant. One important point, however, is that African commoners, like common people, they're rarely benefiting from, from, from this trade. Let me take you, show you very qu uh, quickly what I, I meant by, by the gradual increase. If you look at this chart, this is, this is straight, uh, by the way, this is taken from the slave, um, slavevoyages.org, a database that uh, gives like, very detailed information in terms of the numbers of, this, uh, of the trade, uh, the regions that participated in the trade, the countries, the European countries, and so on, the post of the disembarkation. But in this one, you can see very clearly how during the first uh, sort of like 150 years, the numbers of the trade are relatively low. In that sense, there's no significant benefit. It is from the second half of the 1600s where we're going to see a gradual increase in the demand and, of course, a gradual increase in the benefits from the trade. And it's the material benefits of the trade that are attractive to, to those local actors and who are using the material benefits to expand their political power. So the wealth in and of itself is not that relevant. What they do with that wealth, which is solidify their political power, that's why they are interested in, in, in the benefits, in the material benefits of this trade. Um, here, I told you as well, it's important that we differentiate. Not all regions are equally participated. If you see this bigger circle for West Central Africa, that's the region in, the, in, the, in Atlantic Africa, if you like, that is supplied the most slaves. Of course, the effects in this region will be more significant than if you compare to the region of Sierra Leone, where only a relatively small number of people uh, of, uh, um, were enslaved. Bido Benin, Bido Biafra, very significant also. And the Gold Coast or modern day Ghana, very significant, of course, in terms of the, the, the supply as well. So we have important regions in, in West Africa and, of course, in West Central Africa. And as I said, depending on how many people they're trading, uh, they will be affected differently. Here we can see the numbers a little bit more clearly. Uh, West Central Africa uh, that I mentioned is about uh, over fi five million and a half people uh, traded and followed uh, very far by the bite of Biafra and Benin in modern day Nigeria or the Gold Coast, modern day uh, Ghana. The other three significant uh, regions participating in the, in the trade. Mm -hmm. How was the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans organized on the ground? All right, so the, the thing that we have to keep in mind is that this is a period of the expansion, territorial expansion of Europe, and also the expansion of European um, uh, influence. So as I said, in the 1400s, Europe plays a relatively marginal role in, especially uh, Western Europe, plays a relatively marginal role in the international arena. But now, from the late 1400s, especially from the 1500s, what we're going to see is that oh, they're going to be able to expand, their, uh, to improve their position, right, and to become more powerful in the international arena and, and so on uh, because of the uh, quote-unquote accidental arrival in the, in the Americas. That will create new sources of wealth for, for Europe, as we, as we know, right? But when it comes to Africa, when it comes to Africa, they're, they're, they're still not powerful enough. They have to trade with Africans on, their, on African terms. So it is the Africans who control the trade there. The Europeans are able to create stations to, to establish different uh, commercial stations on the coast, but they have to ask for permission to do that. They ask for permission to the local rulers on, on West and West Central Africa. They are granted that permission, and it is the coastal people who are the ones who are going to supply the slaves to them. They are going to be the middlemen because the slaves actually come from inland. So we have like two fundamental roles. We have the, the middlemen or intermediary uh, 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 actors, African actors on the coast, and we have the, Afri the suppliers farther inland. So the suppliers farther inland are acquiring uh, in, uh, uh, people. They're taking them to the coast. On the coast, these coastal people are uh, buying uh, those uh, enslaved people from, from the peoples from, from the inland regions, and they are selling them to the Europeans. 
So, and those are the two fundamental actors, the, the suppliance, uh, the supplying uh, Africans and the middlemen Africans, so to speak. The, the European position, as I said, is just like buying, buying from them uh, for the most part. So the middlemen states, for example, the middlemen people benefited from this and they were able to create um, small states uh, thanks to their, co to their coastal monopoly. They create a monopoly on the coast. They are the, the only ones who can trade with the people from inland and with the people from, uh, with the people from Europe, with the Europeans. Um, the supply in states, so we're going to see that people's inland, they're going to be able to benefit from this and they are going to expand their, their, the size of their kingdoms and, and, and so on. So uh, how are they obtaining the, 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 the enslaved? So mostly through warfare and village raids. So there's political confrontation in West and in West Central Africa, and out of this political confrontation, the prisoners, many of those prisoners will, will be sold into, into slavery. But outside um, um, periods of war, there will be just attacks against defenseless or relatively, relatively defenseless uh, uh, villages, and, and people will be captured and, or, and, 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 and sold into slavery. Um, but one of the important things that I want to make about this organization is that for the most part, we tend to think that uh, Africans are selling, you know, Africans are selling their brothers and sisters. And that's, that's it's, it's very far from the truth. What they are selling is they're selling human beings, but those human beings that they're selling are considered to be outsiders. There's human beings that belong to different cultural or sociopolitical groups, right? Uh, the human groups, the uh, people who in some cases are uh, their enemies from war, or simply people who, you know, they capture from villages who do not belong to their own social groups and so on. So in that sense, that's an important thing to, to, think, uh, to think about uh, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. How were African societies affected by the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans? Um, this, is, this is one of the things that we still uh, come into grips with, like trying to understand the, the impact, the impact of the trade. Um, clearly, there must have been a demographic impact. Right? But we still do not know very well the size or the magnitude of that demographic impact. Part of the problem is that we don't know what was the population size, what was the size of the population uh, at the time. But the other, thing, the other thing that we have to think is that the effects are not equally felt across the entire region. Those regions that are more, more, more deeply in, involved in the trade obviously are going to suffer the effects more, as I, as I said. And the effects will be more noticeable uh, from the late 1600s, but particularly in the 1700s and the early part of the 1800s. That's when we're going to see that the effects will be more significantly. When it comes to uh, the demographic impact, well, we know that 12.0 million people were, were, were traded, but they were traded over 400 years. So it's, it's difficult to assess the, 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 uh, the exact impact then. But as, as I said, the 1700s and the first half of the 1800s, the volume of the trade is so high that there's no question about that there must have been a significant demographic impact in terms of the population, the loss of population and so on. But those who are feeling that impact, they are fundamentally the victims, the societies that are victims of the trade, not the enslavers. There's enslavers in that sense, they're not uh, the ones who are, that are capturing the enslaved people or the people, they're not really suffering the demographic impact because they are uh, uh, capturing people outside their own social groups. Uh, it's, it, as I said, it's likely that the effects were mostly fell in the long term. Uh, due, uh, so by the 1800s, we can see more like that the impact will be more noticeable. So this is the thing. It's like the gradual nature or uh, evolution of the trade makes that in the beginning, that kind of demographic impact is not noticeable. But as I said, from the late 1700s, and especially the early 1800s, we can see that the impact was more uh, 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 felt more deeply. Um, there are all the impacts that we have to think about. If we think about the social and, and, and uh, or fundamentally the political and the economic impact that we have to think about. So for example, on the coastal regions, the demand, the European demand favor the strengthening of a small uh, commercial state kingdoms. So one of the things, one of the impacts that we're gonna see is the development of small kingdoms on the coastal regions that are, that are uh, in which the political elites, the West African po uh, political elites are able to benefit from the trade and they are converting their wealth into political power. And we see the emergence of some powerful kingdoms or the strengthening of existing kingdoms. Some of these uh, kingdoms are already existed uh, prior to the arrival of the Europeans, like the Kingdom of Congo. 
Uh, in the inland regions, that's what we're going to see a more significant development because uh, those who are supplying the, the, the enslaved Africans are able to uh, strengthen their power. And we can see the, the, the creation of large kingdoms like Oyo in, in, in the part of uh, Yoruba land or southwestern Nigeria, Dahomey, uh, or the kingdom of Asante in modern day Ghana. Right? Uh, another impact of this, and perhaps is, this is a negative impact, is the, is, is the warfare and violence. Or one of the things that warfare insecurity dominated the area, particularly from the late 1600s when the trade expanded. That's when we're going to see, because of the nature of the trade, the nature of the trade required violence to, uh, violence to uh, capture people. Because of that, we're going to see an increase in, in, uh, in violence and insecurity in, in these regions, those regions that are affected by the trade. And obviously, these must have, have economic effects in terms of production. Uh, when people are, n are afraid of going to the fields to work and so on because uh, you can be captured and so on, this must have, have an effect in terms of the, the, uh, the, the region's ability to produce uh, uh, food and, and so on. One of the other things that economic historians tell us is that this trade, as profitable as it was uh, to, um, for the political elites, it did not benefit the local economy significantly. It did not uh, stimulate economic growth and it did not stimulate the transformation of, um, of uh, Af African economies, West African uh, economies. And if we think about technological transfer, sometimes when we have uh, trade, uh, one of the things that we see is that people, uh, people at, who are trading, they are exchanging also ideas and so on. That's not really happening much here. There's a transfer of crops. And we all know about it, right? That, that how some of the African uh, crops are rich the Americas, and, and some of the American crops rich Africa as a result of that. But in terms of technology, there's no significant transfer. And culturally, there's no much transfer either, uh, other than the area of Congo, where we're going to see um, the early uh, Christianization of this part of Africa. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how did the trade affect its African victims? The, the victims, of course, are the subject of our study, but at the same time are the, the people who we know less. It's the people who are actively involved in the trading that we know more about. We don't really, unfortunately, we don't know as much about the experiences of, the, of, the, of those who were captured, right? So we have limited knowledge. The limited knowledge doesn't mean that we don't have a capacity to, to get to know more about the, their experiences. And, but one of the things that has helped is, for example, the memoirs, the memoirs by uh, enslaved Africans. And, and I mentioned here like one like Oludai Olu Kwanu, uh, uh, which is, is one of the um, African-born enslaved who like, late, later on was freed and, 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 and played a major role in terms of the, um, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, struggle uh, or the, the campaign to abolish the slave trade. So these kinds of memoirs written by, uh, by enslaved Africans will provide some in, in valuable information. Of course, we know about the traumatic experiences linked to, the ca to, to being captured, especially in these uh, events that I mentioned of village raids in the middle of the night or, or whenever like, uh, uh, people go into the farms and, 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 and so on. Uh, but it's also equally traumatic, the transport, how they move them from the inland to the coast, how they are in prison on the coast in these castles in, on the coast until they are sold to the Europeans, of course the Middle Passage, and, and the arrival and sale, and I mentioned sometimes the resale that, that is happening. One of the things that I was not aware of is, is how many enslaved people arrived in the Caribbean in the 1700s, who later on from the Caribbean were resold into other parts of the Caribbean or into other parts of the Americas. Um, so the journey did not stop when they arrived in the Caribbean. It continued. Uh, be, uh, one of the things that we know, for example, that the Spanish did not, are not actively involved in the trade. But the Spanish are buying enslaved Africans here in the, in the, in the Caribbean. And, and, and the, so the Caribbean is also sell, uh, like selling and supplying enslaved people to all the parts of the, of the, of the Americas. And of course, uh, another thing that we know, and this is perhaps one of the aspects that we know more about it, is, is the impact uh, in terms of the and how it's affecting the enslaved people in the African continent, in, in, the, in West Africa in particular. In West Africa, one of the things that we're going to see is that whereas slavery was relatively marginal, it was marginal um, uh, at the beginning of the transatlantic trade, by, by, the, by the late 1700s, 
slavery had expanded. And there's a clear connection between the expansion of slavery in West Africa and Afri West Africans' participation in the trade. It seems that the, tra the participation in the trade stimulated the accumulation of enslaved people in West African societies to the extent that by the late 1700s, early 1800s, there's some West African societies that had developed like almost like slave systems similar to the ones in the Americas. And we see also the deterioration of the conditions of these enslaved people. So uh, we oftentimes will look at the, um, the perils of the people who were brought to the Americas, but there are people who uh, remain as, uh, as enslaved people in, in West Africa. And whereas their conditions were originally very different from the ones in the Americas, one of the things that, that it, it's, it's well known now is that by the late 1700s, early 1800s, their conditions in West Africa, in some cases, are, are quite similar to the ones in the Caribbean or other parts of the America in terms of brutality, exploitation, and, and so on. So this is, uh, just to wrap up, this is some of the memoirs that I was telling you, Oludave Equano, uh, interesting one. Uh, this one, a female, Phyllis Whitley, like also tells you about you know, African-born uh, uh, enslaved people who at some point were able to gain freedom. And, and we know about the, the stories and the stories beginning in the African continent and of course continuing in the, in the, in the Americas. So what we can do, where could um, students get access to these memoirs? Uh, these memoirs, to the best of my knowledge, uh, well, we have them obviously in, in, in the library of, of the University of the West Indies. Um, I suspect because they are uh, open source now, they're probably on Google Books as well. Google Books is also a source that they could use in terms of like uh, 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 get, get, getting access to these memoirs. Uh, but these memoirs were important not just for for historians today that we know more about the actual experiences of these uh, of these individuals of these men and women. But we, they, they were important at the time more as a tool to campaign against uh, the trade and a tool to campaign against the ins slavery itself. So uh, the idea was to let uh, Western societies, Western European societies or North American societies know about the cruelty of, of the institution, right? And by telling the, the accounts of these, of these men and women. And in that sense, making people aware that of the cruelty of something uh, that needed to disappear, as, as it did eventually in the, throughout the 1800s. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kenze, for mm -hmm. um, participating in our lecture series. And we want to thank everyone that tuned in today. And please look out for our next episode. And please follow and subscribe um, to the Institute of Jamaica social media platforms. The History and Archaeological Departments, social media platforms, and National Museum Jamaica social platforms. Thanks again, Dr. Kenve. Thank you, Mark. And everyone, stay safe.